the head of the transition team, our next vice president, Mike Pence. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sean, and uh, good morning. It is a momentous day before a historic day, and I'm uh, pleased to have a chance to report uh, to the American people and to all of you uh, the, the progress that we have made uh, at the President-elect's direction, uh, preparing a team that will be ready to serve the American people and make America great again on day one. I'm, I'm grateful to be with all of you today. And before I give you a brief summary, uh, let me first uh, express our thoughts and prayers on behalf of the President-elect uh, and myself for President Bush and Barbara. They're on the hearts of every American. This morning, we understand they had a good night last night, but we encourage every American uh, to remember President Bush and his wonderful wife, Barbara, uh, in their prayers. Seventy-two days ago, we elected Donald Trump to be the 45th President of the United States of America. Seventy-one days ago, uh, Donald Trump set an ambitious uh, schedule uh, prior to this inauguration, and he asked me to chair the transition effort. And I was, uh, I was grateful and honored to be given the opportunity uh, to do just that. Uh, when we took over, uh, I was impressed, frankly, with the work that Governor Christie and the transition team had done prior to the election. More than 170 interviews had already been done prior to Election Day. And I'm pleased to report that as of this morning's announcement for our Secretary of Agriculture, all 21 cabinet nominees have been named, 27 total individuals have been named that require the consent of the Senate, and we have 536 beachhead team members that will be reporting for duty at agencies following the inauguration bright and early uh, on Monday morning. Uh, uh, there are many people, many people to thank uh, in this regard, and I'm really here just to do that. Uh, there is a memorandum that uh, will be in your possession uh, by the end of this briefing that I'll be conveying to the President-elect today to give him a full report on the transition efforts and the progress that we've made, but uh, allow me to give you a couple of top lines. In addition to the hundreds of interviews and meetings that the President-elect has conducted uh, in the course of this transition. I'm pleased to report that the Presidential Appointments Team has conducted more than 170 interviews prior to the election, uh, more than 200 people since the election have sat down with what we call our Tiger Teams for full vetting and full review. I'm happy to say the interest of the American people in this administration has been overwhelming. More than 86,000 resumes have been submitted to the transition and over 4,000 candidate referrals. Uh, and on, on the eve of the inauguration, as I mentioned, our beachhead teams are ready to land uh, and go to work in these, in, in these various agencies of the incoming administration. Uh, on legislative affairs, we uh, organized more than 90 uh, volunteers to create and execute a confirmation strategy to support the 27 publicly announced uh, Senate conf uh, confirmed nominees. Uh, designees uh, attended so far more than 370 visits with senators and will continue to work uh, very, very closely to support their efforts as they move uh, toward confirmation. Uh, there's been work uh, on, uh, on agency action, as I mentioned. Uh, policy implementation, though, has also been very brisk in the course of this transition. Specifically, we focused uh, at the President-elect's direction on uh, a day one, a day 100, and a day 200 action plan uh, for keeping our word to the American people and putting the President-elect's promises into practice. Fourteen policy implementation teams attracted over a Participants, additionally 90 experts have been serving in an advisory capacity as we formulated executive action and legislative policy to pursue the goals of this administration. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we've been listening. Uh, we established through the course of the transition the uh, Office of Nationwide Engagement, uh, O-N-E for short, and they've been busy. 28 listening sessions conducted December 1 through January 13. Uh, and, uh, uh, 22 business days met with uh, and heard top policy issues and concerns from more than 1,200 organizations, associations, and various interests and entities. 
There's an awful lot of people to thank, and there's more details that you'll see in the memorandum that I'll be conveying to the President-elect today. But let me begin by expressing my appreciation, uh, first and foremost, uh, to uh, uh, President Barack Obama and Vice President uh, Joe Biden. Uh, the cooperation uh, that the outgoing administration has extended in this transition effort uh, would make every American proud. Uh, and I know the President-elect has expressed his appreciation, not just for the hospitality, but for the collaboration of this administration in supporting uh, our team's transition efforts, and I would reiterate that today. Also very grateful to the GSA Administrator, Denise Turner-Roth, uh, and her outstanding team uh, here at GSA for the work that they've done to support our efforts. Uh, also grateful for the uh, Vice Chairs and the Executive Committee of the transition effort who have put in very long hours a number of them are with us today. Uh, uh, ben Carson uh, is, uh, is with us, Rudy Giuliani, uh, Jeff Sessions, uh, Marsha Blackburn, uh, Tom Reed represent a uh, part of the vice chair uh, team. Uh, and uh, we express our appreciation on behalf of the president-elect for the many, many hours that you put in helping us to assemble this day one team. We also express appreciation to the members of our executive uh, committee who donated literally hundreds of hours in assisting us uh, in preparing, preparing the recommendations uh, to, uh, to the President-elect over the course of this. Uh, lastly, I have just uh, two more things to mention. And number one is just to thank my team. You know, there's, a, uh, there's a, an old saying that when you see, in, back in Indiana, when you see a box turtle on a fence post, one thing you know for sure is they had help getting there. And um, I, I can tell you uh, that while it's been my privilege to chair this transition effort, the team uh, that uh, we've had around us uh, and the extraordinary seven-day-a-week hours that they've put into this effort is greatly to their credit. I want to specifically thank the executive director, Rick Dearborn, who's done a, a masterful job. Uh, extremely grateful for the energetic leadership of our incoming White House Chief of Staff, Ryan Supremus, uh, incoming uh, uh, General Counsel at the White House, Don McGahn, uh, literally working uh, almost around the clock uh, in supporting the efforts of this transition effort. Uh, for our team here, Bill Haggerty on presidential appointments, Ron Nickel on agency action, uh, Otto Machito and Andrew Bremberg on policy, Jamie Burke uh, and uh, Elizabeth Pinkerton on personnel. Uh, Eric Uland on legislative affairs and a, a balance of a team uh, that, uh, that would make anyone proud. The progress that we have made in the course of this transition and the extraordinarily brisk pace with which it's been conducted is a tribute to the integrity and the work ethic of these men and women. Uh, and, uh, and I know the President-elect is grateful for their efforts, and uh, as chair, I am as well. Uh, uh, Ken Hagan is taking over as executive director to wind down the transition. The uh, Office of White House personnel will take over the official duties as we continue in the weeks and months ahead uh, to fill out the balance of the administration. But this is the team that got us, that got us here to this day at the direction uh, of the president-elect. Um, Lastly, I'm, I'm especially pleased, and I know the President-elect is especially pleased, that we're wrapping up this transition uh, on schedule and under budget. <laughs> uh, we, will, uh, we will actually return some 20 percent uh, of taxpayer funding uh, back to the U.S. Treasury, uh, and that is just exactly uh, in keeping with the President-elect's expectations uh, going forward. He is a businessman that knows how to sharpen his pencil. And I'm very pleased to report today that we were able to do that um, and, uh, and, and restore those dollars to the Treasury. But let me say I'm, I've uh, been very, uh, very honored uh, to serve as chair of the transition effort. But all that we've accomplished here, uh, credit goes uh, to a great team, our volunteers, literally hundreds and hundreds of volunteers who've put in, in hours and hours to support this effort, our executive committee, our vice chairs, our staff. Uh, but really, the credit, I can tell you, goes to our president-elect. Uh, sometimes people stop me on the street and they say, they say, how are you holding up? I can't imagine how busy you are. And I, I just tell them, well, you just have to understand that the energy and the enthusiasm of Donald Trump is contagious. Uh, and it's been his energy and his expectation that's driven uh, this transition effort. I'm proud to say to be at a place where we've named our entire cabinet uh, before we reach that historic day tomorrow. Uh, our job really was to make sure President-elect had the opportunity to make decisions, uh, to assemble uh, the team around him that uh, will make America great again, and I'm humbled to have been a small part of that. Our job is to be ready on day one, 
the American people can be confident uh, that we will be. Um, so uh, uh, let me say to all of you, we look forward, look forward to seeing you tomorrow. It'll be, be a very humbling and moving day for the president-elect, his family, and for mine. But let me tell you, we are all, uh, we are all uh, ready to go to work. In fact, we can't wait to get to work for the American people to make America great again. So thank you very much, and we'll provide that information for you at the end of the briefing. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice President-elect. Uh, I think uh, he speaks for all of us when we say that we are truly excited for tomorrow. Uh, there's a historic change coming, and uh, it is infectious. The entire team is looking forward uh, to this now that we are 24 hours out uh, of this. Um, so uh, the, the President-elect continues to make edits and additions to his inaugural address. Um, we will. Um, uh, we'll have further updates for you on that, but I know it was asked yesterday in the speech. Uh, it's going to be a very personal and sincere statement about his vision for the country. Uh, he will discuss what it means to be an American, the challenges that we face as members of the middle class that fa they face. He'll talk about infrastructure and education, our manufacturing base. Um, I think it's going to be less of an agenda and more of a philosophical uh, document, a vision of where he sees the country the proper role of government, the role of citizens. Um, so look forward to that tomorrow. Um, with respect to the action on Capitol Hill that the Vice President-elect was mentioning, I think the nominees continue to go up to Capitol Hill and impress uh, the American people and the United States Senator with the caliber and quality of people that the President-elect has chosen. Um, Shelley Moore Capitol of West Virginia said of Scott Pruitt, he's the best choice for the EPA. He'll help restore the EPA to its original lawful mission. As Leader McConnell mentioned of Wilbur Ross that he has experienced to help turn the country, country around. Uh, John Thune said uh, his business know-how will make him a great Commerce Secretary. Uh, Senator Marco Rubio of Florida said Governor Nikki Haley will stand up for American values at the UN. Uh, Arizona Governor Doug Ducey said that Dr. Tom Price is someone that Americans can finally work towards a patient-centered health care. Um, today we've got more activity up on Capitol Hill. Energy Secretary nominee Rick Perry and Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin will both be up there on Capitol Hill testifying. I think no one understands the intersection of the American economy and the American industry energy industry than former Governor uh, Rick Perry of Texas. He's well known to the Senate and to the American people. Um, there's a great deal of reform coming to Washington and nothing sends the message stronger that nominating a leader like Rick Perry to take the helm will do. Uh, over his 30-year career in finance, Stephen Mnuchin has established a reputation of being a solution-oriented leader, a dedicated team builder, and an excellent communicator. These qualities will serve him well as he works with Congress and the administration to hamper out a tax package that will spur economic growth, create jobs, and help hardworking Americans uh, and allow businesses to compete on a global basis. Um, I mentioned yesterday, but we will have further staff announcements today, both on the commission staff, the special assistants, deputy assistants, and assistants to the president. We'll also release some of the non-commissioned support staff as well. Uh, this morning, uh, the, as the Vice President-elect noted, we have officially filled the cabinet with the announcement of Sonny Perdue as the next Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, a few more uh, staff announcements, uh, personnel notes that I want to get through. Uh, we will announce today that Dab Kern will remain at the White House as the Deputy Assistant to the President and Director of the White House Military Office. Dab has been serving, Dab has been serving in an acting role during the Obama administration. Uh, the President-elect intends to make that a permanent uh, position for him. The president-elect understands how it's important to ensure the continuity of government. Uh, so in addition to the appointments that we've announced and will announce, um, the president-elect has asked over 50 individuals to stay in critical posts throughout the government. Included uh, in this group are Robert Work, current defense, Chuck Rosenberg, the DEA administrator, Nick Rasmussen, the director of the National Counterterrorism Center, it's Tom Shannon, the uh, Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs, uh, Susan Coppage in the Department of State, which is the Office to Monitor and Combat Trafficking in Persons, um, Brett McGurk, who is the Special Envoy for the Global Coalition to Counter ISIS, um, Cody uh, Kinsley, the Assistant Secretary of Management at the Department of Treasury, uh, Adam Subin, 
uh, who's the uh, acting undersecretary for terrorism and financial intelligence of the Department of Treasury, are just some of the individuals who will be staying aboard uh, for the trans through uh, th through the time being until a, a replacement can be named. Um, here's the rundown for. Um, events that are occurring today and tomorrow. Please keep in mind that all timing is approximate and uh, continue to check the official schedule. Today at 12.30, the President-elect, uh, Chief of Staff Reince Priebus, Mr. Tom Barrick, the Chairman of the Presidential Inaugural Committee, Sarah Armstrong, the CEO of the Presidential Inaugural Committee, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, White House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy, and Cabinet designees and White House Senior Staff will attend a leadership luncheon at the Trump International Hotel. Uh, that's a pool event. Uh, at 3 p.m., there will be a presidential, the president-elect, the vice president-elect and their families will attend a wreath-laying ceremony at Arlington National Cemetery. At 4 p.m., the president-elect, the vice president-elect and their families will attend the Make America Great Again rally and concert at the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, tomorrow, big day for everyone. It's the next inauguration day. It's the next it's inauguration day. Uh, it'll begin with the president-elect, uh, his family, the vice president-elect and his family, Cabinet designees, family and friends attending an 8.30 church service at St. John's Church, located at uh, 1525 8th Street, right across from the White House. Uh, at 9.30, the President-elect and his family, the Vice President-elect and his family, uh, will attend a White House tea on the south portico of the White House. At 10.30, they will travel to the Capitol for the swearing-in. At 11 o'clock, the President-elect, the Trump family, Vice President-elect and his family will attend the swearing-in um, at the, on the west lawn of the U.S. Capitol. Um, at 1 p.m., the President-elect, the Vice President-elect, First Lady Melania Trump, Second Lady Karen Pence will attend a Joint Congressional Inaugural Committee luncheon at the U.S. Capitol. At 2.30 p.m., they will attend the Military Review uh, located at the U.S. Capitol on the East Front. And at, two, at uh, 3 o'clock, they will attend the inaugural parade uh, in stands just outside of the, uh, of the White House. At 7 p.m., uh, President Trump, Vice President Pence, First Lady Melania, and Second Lady Karen Pence will attend the Liberty and Freedom Ball at the Washington Convention Center uh, at Mount, off Mount Vernon Ave. Following that, they'll attend the Military Ball, which is at the National Building Museum. Uh, on Saturday at approximately 10 a.m., the President, uh, the Vice President and their families will attend the National Prayer Service at the Washington National Cathedral. Um, over the weekend, the incoming staff um, will be uh, located here at the PTT to uh, help support the transition. Um, on the eve of the inauguration, one point that's important, we have over 536 Beachhead team members. These are the individuals that are being placed into agencies and departments throughout the government. Uh, they have been identified to support those things. Um, this is an unprecedented number of individuals that are going to be ready on day one, as far back as we can see. Uh, and I think that is important, uh, as well as the individuals I mentioned early, to ensure continuity of government and to ensure that we're ready on day one to, uh, to get things happening. Um, we intend to have the first briefing at the White House on Monday in the James Brady briefing room. Uh, time will be announced. Uh, as a logistical note, um, I would just say that uh, during this weekend, uh, we intend to, we've worked with the White House Correspondents Association to ensure that a pool camera is located here. Should there be a need for any briefing, uh, that's, this would be the location where it would take place uh, in order to facilitate a uh, much easier logistics of getting in and out. Um, I know some of you are interested in getting your passes. Um, we're working with the current White House. They've been very helpful. Uh, make sure you email our team. We'll help facilitate reporters who don't have uh, hard passes to get in and out of the White House complex throughout the weekend and on Monday. Obviously, the greater leeway that we have in terms of timing is appreciated. Um, with respect to um, the cabinet, before I turn it over, um, I think that there's no question, we've noted before, the high quality and caliber of the individuals uh, that the president-elect has selected to lead his government. Um, I think even uh, the Senate leadership on the Democratic side admitted so much. They talked about going after just a few of them. Um, and it's, I think what's a shame right now is to see some of those individuals who we would call consensus candidates, people who they didn't even find a problem with, people like Secretary Elaine Chao, Ben Carson, Nikki Haley, um, suddenly not be part of Senator Schumer's list that he will work with us to get done on day one. It's disappointing. These were people that are highly qualified, that were considered quote-unquote consensus candidates uh, pr uh, prior to a few weeks ago. Um, and I think that it really speaks volumes that the Democratic leadership is not working with us to ensure a continuity of government. This was not the precedent that was set 
by Senate Republicans when they worked with the Obama administration in 2008 to ensure that the President Obama, despite political differences, got the cabinet of his choosing because they were qualified individuals. Um, I expect the same standard for our individuals, and I think Senate, Senator Schumer should do the same, recognize that this is more about continuity of government and ensuring that these qualified individuals get voted on as soon as possible so that we can lead this country forward. Um, with that, I'd be glad to take some of your questions. John Roberts. Um, yesterday you, you promised that you'd be able to shed a little more light on the first orders that the incoming president will sign right. on Friday and maybe give us uh, some idea of what's coming up on Monday. Yeah, I'm going to have to continue to update you on that. Uh, the the president-elect is continuing to get briefed on uh, some of the orders that he wants to do and the sequencing thereof. Uh, I think we've talked about that for a few months now. Um, Obamacare, um, the, the fight against ISIS, he talked about um, immigration, key issues that have been important to him throughout the campaign that will continue to be important to him in this administration. He is committed to not just day one, um, but day two, day three of enacting an, an agenda of real change. And I think that you're going to see that um, in the days and weeks to come. What he's trying to do is ensure a proper sequencing. Staff is continuing to meet with him about that. But again, I think you'll see some activity on, on both tomorrow, over the weekend, uh, and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So it's going to be a robust, uh, not just day one, but I think day, first week, first month, and probably first term. Do you know how many of tomorrow's orders are simply processed? The, the uh, there, I, I, I would... I don't want to go there yet. I think the president-elect is still working through which ones he wants to deal with tomorrow versus Monday or Tuesday. Uh, we'll try to get a read out of those going forward, but it is it is a work in progress. There's a lot to be done. Sean, yes. Sean. Yeah. Um, I'm Gavin with Univision. I, I would like to know if we are going to the White House press corps are going to still work at the West, uh, at the West Wing. Yeah, I think that's been asked and answered. I mean, as you can tell by today, um, there is a tremendous interest, frankly, an unprecedented interest in covering this president. The demand and, and enthusiasm to understand the agenda that he has um, and that what he's going to be doing is, is you know, frankly, unprecedented. Um, we have tried to be accommodating and, and looked at additional room space. As we've announced previously, we're going to continue, as I noted, we'll host the first meeting in the James Brady briefing room. It's going to be a little cramped, I imagine, uh, but that's where we'll, we'll hold at least the first couple briefings for now. Um, so I hope that answers. Oh, Cecilia. Can you confirm that the president-elect has plans to go to the CIA in the near future and is this, for lack of a better term, to make nice after everything that's happened? Uh, I would say there's no qu I'm sorry? Yeah, so uh, Cecilia asked whether or not he had plans to go to the CIA. Uh, I'm sure that at some point shortly he will visit not just the CIA but a lot of the departments. I mentioned yesterday during the briefing that the president continues to be humbled uh, by the people who serve this nation and the work that they do so many times uh, without the proper recognition for the sacrifices that they make in terms of time. So many of them could be making more in the private sector but they continue to serve this government. Um, and I think the enthusiasm to serve in government and be part of this administration has gotten greater by the day. There are so many people that have submitted a resume or said I want to go back into public service or join the military um, because they've been inspired by the president-elect's message. And, um, and so I think not just the CIA but several departments, he's going to visit and make sure that he tells them how much he appreciates their service to our country, their commitment to acting an agenda of change. Um, and recognize uh, how much they really do for this country. So it's not just going to be the CIA, but I think you're going to see a lot of activity uh, throughout not just the first week, the first month, and the first year of making that a priority to thank uh, so many of the people who serve our government. Um, and, and again, not just federal servants, but so many people who volunteer their time in various ways to serve this nation, both paid and unpaid. But does the president oh, feel that there needs to be uh, some fence mending, if you will, on behalf of the, with the intelligence community? No, I, I think he has been very clear. His statement that he put out the Friday that he got the briefing, he respects the work and diligence of the intelligence community. The men and women who so often serve in the intelligence community without recognition because of the very nature of the work they do is something that he has a true understanding of the sacrifice that they make. Uh, and so he has been very, very clear that while he may have differences sometimes with the leadership of the intelligence community, uh, that the work of the individuals, the men and women who tirelessly um, support the analysis and, and, and readings of, of the intelligence community is something that he will uh, continue to show his support for and his thanks. Sean, your list
list of cabinet picks is the first since 1988. It doesn't include any Hispanics. I know you got a question about this yesterday as well. What do you say to Hispanic groups who are concerned about that? And what do you say more broadly about the criticism that this undercuts President-elect Trump's argument that he is here to serve all Americans? Well, he is here to serve all. I mean, thank you for the question. I think that when you look at the totality of his administration, the people that he's talked to, the people that he's uh, met with, the people that he's appointing, uh, you see a president who is committed to uniting this country, who's bringing the best and the brightest together. But look at the, look at the cabinet. Elaine Chao, Dr. Ben Carson, Nick, Governor Nikki Haley, the first Indian American. I, I think that he's one, the number one thing that I think Americans should focus on is, is he hiring the best and the brightest? Is he hiring people who are committed to enacting real change, respecting taxpayers, bringing about uh, an agenda that will create jobs, lift up wages? And I think that what you're seeing and you're going to continue to see, not just through the cabinet, but through the entire thing, is a diversity in gender, a diversity in thinking, and a diversity of, of ideology. So it's not just about you know, skin color or ethnic heritage, but you look at the totality of this cabinet, an Indian American, African American, um, you know, Asian American, it's, it's, about, it's about a lot of things. And I think you can start to pick out one group and say, where is the percentage of that? But if you look at the totality of the people that he's meeting with, the people that he's bringing in for senior staff positions, cabinet, sub-cabinet, deputy, we're going to have 5,000 positions. And it's not, so, so I think that you can pick out one subset. But if you look at the totality of the diversity that he's bringing in this, I would, I would say that it's probably something to hold up second to none. But given that some of his comments about Latinos, about immigration, was such a hot button topic during the campaign, right. why not make that a priority in terms of... It is a priority. No, no, because I, I can... That signal. Right. And I think it is a priority. But I think that it's, very, it's a very narrow way to look at it and say if you don't appoint people to this particular position, that's a problem. The, I just mentioned you know, the, the level of diversity that's throughout not just the cabinet, but his staff, and the other appointments that he's going to make, I guarantee you that when we've continued to, as we continue to announce this, that problem will, will be something that people look at and respect the level of diversity throughout his entire administration. Yes, sir. Paolo Mastroilli with the Italian Daily La Stampa. Uh, Italy, as you know, will uh, welcome President Trump to the first G7 in uh, May. Do you think that as president of the G7, Italy should consider re-inviting Russia to the meeting? Well, that's up to, to them to decide. I'm not going to get ahead of what the Italian government... Steve Holland. How, how many nominees do you expect to have in the next few days confirmed? And, and what conversations are you having with Senator Schumer, Senator McConnell to get the process moving? I think the, vi the vice president's been in contact with Senate leadership. I know Senator McConnell's been working tirelessly to get the situation going. There is really no excuse for the delay tactics and, frankly, the partisanship uh, that's being exhibited by the Democrats. There's a time and a place for it. I get it. But again, I think if you hold them to the standard that they were held in 08, you recognize the fact that they are continuing to employ delay tactics after delay tactic, which isn't good for the government. I mean, I cited yesterday a poll in which over 50 percent of the American people believe that the national um, economic and security teams should be confirmed immediately. And the idea that they're delaying that further calls into question their desire to have a, a, go a government of con continuity. And it sends not just a signal to the folks in the United States, but frankly around the world um, that we're not, that they're questioning the ability of continuity of government. We've taken the proper steps to ensure, as I mentioned earlier, critical positions were filled. We have a p plan to ensure that in every department there's a key individual ready to go. So, but I, I think it's disappointing. Um, that they have chosen to do this. And again, I noted this before, but if you look at the questions that are being asked in these confirmation hearings, it's not about substance. It's not about policy. It's not about the, the issues of, in front of that department. It's about partisan uh, hacks and, I mean, partisan attacks and, and ethical questions. That's not, that these people have had their paperwork in, their quality and caliber and uh, integrity is unquestionable. And I think to see some of these attacks and the focus not be on issues like schools and teachers and homeland security is, is, a, is a problem. There are so many issues facing this country that we need to get moving on. And the idea that Democrats would use these stall tactics, it's just, it's not, it's not in the country's best interest. Yes, ma'am. Do you think anybody will be confirmed Question on Monday? I hope so. I mean, uh, yeah, we're, 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 Senator uh, McConnell has been working tirelessly to get as many nominees confirmed as possible so that we're ready to go. And as soon as um, Senator Schumer and other Democrats uh, are willing to work with him. Um, but again, you look at the comments they made. They came out with their so-called hit list. There are individuals, as I mentioned, Secretary Chow, Dr. Ben Carson, um, Governor Nikki Haley, that weren't on their political hit list. They're consensus candidates. And while every one of them...
qualified to lead this country in their de respective department. The idea that they're expanding this list and slowing down the continuity of government is unacceptable. They, they owe an explanation on those three individuals at the very least. Why are they delaying Elaine Chao? Why are they not moving on Dr. Ben Carson? Why are they not moving on Governor Nikki Haley? The other ones, there's no question their qualifications, and that, that I would agree that they should move all of them. But those individuals weren't even on their political hit list. Why are they holding up those three individuals in particular? Yes, ma'am. The question on trade, global trade is specifically, as you're probably aware, the Chinese president lauded the merits of free trade this week. I'd ask you two questions about trade. What is your message to Beijing about the role that America is going to play in global trade? And secondly, are you willing to work with Beijing in places where you have commonalities as well as confront them in places you don't? Yeah, I, I think the president's message on trade has been fairly clear. Um, he is going to fight for American workers and American manufacturing. And that's going to be the number one thing that guides him going forward. Um, and so he, was, he has talked about bilateral deals, making sure, but he's going to make sure that every deal that he cuts, just like he did in business, puts American, American workers and American manufacturing, American services, American um, first. And so whether it's China or any other country, uh, that's going to be the priority. But with respect to China alone, I mean, it's a huge marketplace uh, for American workers and small businesses. You look at the commitment that Alibaba made the other day when they met with him, talking about increasing access to small businesses. Uh, it's important that individuals who might have a, tra a craft or a product that they have, they're working at home at, or maybe it's just a small business, have the opportunity to access those marketplaces that at one point might be too far for them to reach, but through uh, the technology that, that we have available to us now. And so he's going to continue to fight, whether it's the Chinese market or, or other places around the globe, for market access. But again, the guiding principle is always going to be the American worker and American manufacturing. Yeah. Dale House, late from WHDH TV, Boston. Getting back to your idea that the president wants to work with and for people who weren't with him in the election. Right. How long will he continue trying when the other side is boycotting the inaugural and, in your own words, not helping with nominations until he says, I'm just going to work with the people who got me there? I don't think that's going to happen. I mean, you look at the people that he's meeting with, he's got a commitment of uniting this country, bringing people together, Republicans, Democrats, people that were for him, against him, agnostic during the campaign, uh, but he has continued to meet with people who have ideas about how to move the country forward, how to create jobs, how to reinvigorate our manufacturing base, and if people have a good idea about how to do that, he's not really concerned with what they've said or done in the past if their commitment is about the future. Can you point uh, to anyone he's already brought into the fold? No sure, he had an entire meeting with the tech industry uh, where he sat down with 25 tech titans. I, I think, you know, look at some of the individuals you met. I don't think uh, some of the individuals, I'm not going to get into some of the past statements that they may have made, but I think if you start Googling, you'll find some folks that may have been entirely focused on supporting him or supported another candidate. And that's, again, I think it's shown through his actions in terms of who he's appointed, who he's met with. It's, this is about moving the country forward. I think he has shown a deep concern for putting America, getting America back on track, and he is really not concerned with the past. Major Garrett. Sean, can you reconcile the Vice President-elect statement that you're ready on day one with your comments that there are continuity of government issues created yeah. by the stall of Senate Democrats? You can't have it both ways. Sure you can. can you Absolutely. Comment? Sure. I, I think there's a difference. As I've noted, we've appointed over 50 people in critical positions to maintain their office until we can find a successor in this, for this administration. So we've looked through the entire government and found areas where there's a critical need to maintain someone. In an area where a department, for example, the secretary won't be available, there's a continuity in, gov in government place to ensure that the highest level person assumes those duties as acting. So, you can see those are placeholder people until your cabinet secretaries are confirmed and they can't carry out sure the mandate can. of the president. No, no, there's a difference. There's a, right, but there's a difference between enacting an agenda and making sure that if there's an issue or a concern, continuity of government is if there's an, is a attack or some kind of weather incident that occurs where each of our departments have to be called into action to support the American people, we're ready to go. Make no mistake, we're ready to go on day one. So, day one. So, there's a big difference between being ready to go and start enacting some of the things. There, there are limitations to what some of these individuals can do in terms of enacting the agenda. But in terms of being ready to go and being able to respond to an incident, we're ready to go at 12.01 tomorrow. Are you going to keep him for the entire duration of the ICE? We'll, we'll have to evaluate that. Right now, our, our, our focus was on continuity of government. And on a case-by-case -case basis, we'll work with those individuals and the departments. Yes? Um, Shannon Petty, Lisa Bloomberg. Um, on trade, 
Is the president-elect going to wait until his cabinet is beginning negotiations with Mexico and Canada on NAFTA? Or if the USTR and the Secretary of Commerce are not in place, will the president <coughs> go and contact those countries' presidents and begin talks directly? I think uh, I'm not going to get ahead of him, but I will tell you that uh, he is part of what he announced um, in the executive order list around the Thanksgiving time um, included the actions on both TPP and NAFTA uh, that would be done by executive order. So I think you'll see those happen very shortly. Uh, when and where is, is going to, in terms of where that cabinet piece falls in, some of it has to do, frankly, right now with Senate Democrats. But I don't think he's going to wait. He has made it very clear that some of those things are huge priorities for him. Sean. Yes. Sean Carding, from Britain's Channel 4 News. I'm just wondering, you said yesterday that there will be a couple of visits next week. Right. Theresa May, Britain's been told that it's the top of the list as far as trade deals. No, I, I was talking specifically about agencies and departments. But there are no foreign leaders expected next week? I, I'm not, I don't, nothing is expected next week in terms of foreign leader visits. They will, will have an update on that at some point. Phil Rucker. Yeah, uh, you talked about some of the agencies and the contingency plan, but can you just address the National Security Council uh, in the White House? Only a couple of people, I believe, have been appointed so far. Are there going to be more appointments before uh, tomorrow or over the weekend, or what are you doing to make sure that's... Yeah, I, I'm not sure that that's true. I mean, we have a, a great group of folks that's been in constant contact with the National Security Council and the Homeland Security Council. So you've got General Flynn and KT McFarland on the national security front, Tom Bossert on the Homeland Security front. And as I mentioned, there are several individuals within both the Homeland Security Council and the National Security Council that are being held over in critical positions and they're working with it. The other issue is that there's a lot of individuals um, who are detailed and are going to be staying on board. Um, the contact and level of support back and forth in the National Security Council alone has been tremendous. We've had um, reams of briefings and um, uh, and people that have come over and, and met with this national, the incoming National Security Council. That is one area where, frankly, uh, they have been very, very aggressive and robust with both meeting with their counterparts and ensuring that the team is ready to go day one. Okay. Um, ethics experts and former White House lawyers have expressed deep concern over Donald Trump's plan to separate himself from his business. Uh, the uh, OGE director said that handing over control to his sons is not enough. He called it wholly inadequate. Uh, given that he hasn't released his taxes, given that 74% of Americans want him to release his taxes, will he at least give a list of who he is in debt to? And if, if not, why not? I think that question has been asked and answered a hundred times. He stood in front... Katie, I, no, I, I get that. I, I heard the question. So I think the, the president-elect has made it very clear. He has no conflicts by law. He has gone above and beyond in terms of making sure that he separates himself from his business, hands it over to his kids, um, and then put in place a very, very rigorous plan to ensure that no conflicts of interest occur. He has gone above and beyond what is ever required of him. He has no conflicts by law. So what he has done is extraordinary to ensure that his focus is entirely on the cab, uh, on helping this country move forward. Francesca. Francesca, thank you. Thank you. Francesca. Could you give us a little bit more color and information on how the then president plans to spend his first weekend at the White House and some more information on what he plans to do during his first week and also clarify that those departmental meetings that were coming up like the CIA will also be taking place next week? Well, I, as I mentioned to Cecilia, I don't, I'm not going to get into the schedule at this point in terms of what he's doing, but yeah, he'll, as I, I read out the schedule so far as to what he's doing, um, he's going to, you know, there'll be time carved out for executive order signings as he chooses. Uh, there's a lot of work that's going to occur over the weekend in terms of meeting with staff, getting prepared, uh, and then as, as, of, as we get closer to, uh, to Monday, we'll have an update on the schedule in terms of where he might be going or other uh, signings that he'll be conducting. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was wondering, there's a lot of rumors floating around uh, about the uh, first executive orders. And can you clarify whether or not he'll issue an immigration um, executive order on Monday or sometime next week? Um, I know you said you promised that you would give us more details. Um, I know you've already gone over the ones that deal with logistics and government operations, right. but there's a lot of concern about what he'll come up with in terms of immigration. Well, look, I, I, A, as I said earlier, we're going to have an update on the schedule. The president-elect is still uh, working 
uh, with the team to decide how he wants to sequence these things. But I would refer you back to the video again. I mean, he laid out very clearly what his top priorities are going to be. And I think it should be no surprise to anybody that immigration, job creation, manufacturing, tax reform are all at the top of that list. And so it's just frankly a question of sequencing. But right now, uh, he is committed to, to getting those things done, and we're working on the timing. Zeke Miller. Uh, thanks, Sean. Uh, in terms of the uh, in terms of the campaign against uh, ISIL or ISIS, uh, this, the ongoing strikes, the U.S. troops who are on the ground um, in training or other capacities, will those all will all of those continue? Is that is the president elect preparing to make to provide any new orders on that front um, at 12:01 tomorrow to change that to change the ISIS the current ISIS strategy? Right. Um, with respect to ISIS, I mean, I think he's talked about very clearly uh, that he wants a plan from the Joint Chiefs uh, very quickly to combat ISIS to what, how, the, how we look at a whole of government approach to that. Um, he's continuing to meet with his national security team uh, about what's in place and what he needs to do, but I'm not going to get in front of what decisions he'll make tomorrow. We'll announce all of that, but again, I think what we've ensured is that for the time being, we've got a team in place that will continue to advise him and make sure that the country remains safe and that our, our priorities are carried out. Okay. Shane. Here's right, Shane. Sean, last week, um, Trump's lawyer talked a lot about separating from his business interests. Uh, both last night and today, he's scheduled to visit his own hotel, promote the dining room there, the food there. How do you support these two things? That he's going to his own hotel? I mean, I think that's pretty smart. Um, well, I, I don't, again, I, I think the idea that he's going to his own hotel shouldn't be a shocker. Uh, it's a beautiful place. It's somewhere that he's very proud of, and I think it's symbolic of the kind of government that he's going to run. On time, under budget, or excuse me, ahead of time and under budget. Uh, same kind of theme that the Vice President-elect expressed earlier, this transition. 20% under budget, $1.2 million returned to the Treasury. Um, he's very proud. It's an absolutely stunning hotel. I encourage you to go there if you haven't been by. Um, but I don't think the idea that President-elect Trump is having a reception um, at the Trump Hotel should be a shocker to anybody. Yeah. Um, Trey Yanks with One American News. And now that the cabinet nominations are filled, what message do you have for senators on Capitol Hill when it comes to the speed of the confirmations? Well, look, I, I think I've, a I've talked about this before, but I, it's important that we get these individuals up in front. There's no one that's really questioning their their qualifications or their caliber or their ability to lead their department, their understanding and grasp of the issues. These are amazing individuals that have a commitment to enacting a, an agenda of change. And, um, and so my message is simply, let's get it done. This is not time for partisan politics. This is time to get the American, to ensure that the American people have a government in place uh, that can get that done. Yeah, in the back. I'm coming from uh, Israel. Um, regarding the Middle East, there are plenty of reports that um, the president might move the American embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Right. Can you confirm that he decided to do it? Uh, what I can tell you is stay tuned. There will be a further announcement on that. I think the president's made very clear that Israel is, is um, not desert, gotten the attention it deserves or the respect in the last eight years. He intends to really show um, his respect for Israel, the importance of it is in the Middle East. Um, and, and I think he has continued to talk with his team, uh, both Ambassador-designate David Friedman, Jared Kushner, um, others, Rex Tillerson, about how we're going to, to work with Israel. I think first and foremost, um, it, how to make sure that uh, we continue to support our ally Israel. That is something that's going to be the priority of this administration. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you said the president was focused in finding the best and the brightest people for his government. But I, I wonder, can you understand that with 56 million of Hispanic people in the U.S., it's like adding offense to the injury to say that there was nobody bright enough for the president. That's to not what I said. No, I, I, he has tremendous respect. Um, and again, I think you have to look at the totality uh, of, of diversity that exists within this cabinet. Um, there are so many ways to express this, both in terms of gender and background, race, um, ideology. He continues to put together an amazingly diverse cabinet. And I think, so if you're looking specifically at Hispanics, I think as we move forward, we've got 5,000 jobs to fill. There's going to be a tremendous number of, of Hispanic Americans that fill those posts. And I, I just, I caution people to stay tuned. Lots of great things are coming. Julie Pace. Hey, Sean, are you guys going to send anybody to the Syria talks on Monday? Uh, I'll have an update for you soon. I, I'll, try to read that out to the pool. But 
Moving on the you numbers can. that you were talking about earlier, because sure. I just want to make sure we're not conflating different things. Right. So you talked about the 536 Six. people on the beachhead team. That's right. What does that mean in terms of the 4,000 political That's opinion? a great question. Thank you for clarifying that. So there's 536 um, individuals that are on these beachhead teams. They are temporary employees uh, that serve as assistants to uh, the, the secretary designates office. Uh, those individuals are able to work in the um, as temporary of officials for I think it's up to 120 days. Um, in some cases they stay on. It will be up to the, uh, the secretary or the, the administrator of the department or agency to decide whether to maintain them on. Maybe they choose to not stay on board but um, in any case that will be a decision that gets made. So if, if they stay, then they are counted as part of that overall thing. But again, that's a mutual decision that the incoming secretary or administrator or director would make in consultation with the individual whether or not that they wanted to stay on board and whether the individual wanted to stay on board. What does that mean in terms of where you guys are on the 4,000 number? Well, uh, it, that's, so those people are temporary. So in some cases, until the secretary or administrator or director is confirmed, um, they are unable to make a permanent appointment. We are working, at, as I've mentioned before, very, very aggressively um, at the undersecretary, the deputy secretary, undersecretary, assistant secretary, um, and ambassador levels to have individuals ready to go. Um, now that the cabinet is filled, I think that you will see a lot more activity at that level. But the president-elect wanted to make sure that his entire cabinet was locked and loaded before he started getting to the, to the deputy under an assistant level. Um, now that that is complete as of this morning with the appointment of Sonny Perdue as the next Secretary of Agriculture, I think you'll see a lot more activity at that lower level. Once those individuals are then confirmed, I think you, they will make a decision uh, whether or not any of those 536 individuals become part of the overall package going forward. Thank you guys very much. It's been a pleasure. I look forward to seeing you on Monday. Have a great weekend, and uh, tomorrow's going to be a very special day. Thank you. Thank you.